Um, we are uh, back in Deuteronomy. We're going to be in chapter 22 and 23. But what we're going to do is we're going to start with a video first. Some of you have seen this video if you've been around for a little while. Uh, those of you that have not, this is going to be helpful in understanding the book of Deuteronomy. So let's, let's start with the video. The book of Deuteronomy, the epic conclusion to the Torah, and spoiler alert, Moses is going to die. Now, in order to understand this book, we need to remember the story so far. So Israel has escaped from slavery in Egypt. Then they spend one year at Mount Sinai. This is where they made the covenant with God to obey all of these laws. Then they wander around the desert for 40 years before they make it to the Jordan River, which is right across from the land God promised them. They're ready to go in. This is where the book of Deuteronomy begins. And what this book is really is a speech. Moses gives these final words, it's like a pep talk, to the new generation of Israel that's about to go into the land. And the speech, it's broken up into three large sections. So Moses begins the first part of the speech with a somber tone because he's highlighting Israel's rebellion and resistance, which has been going on for the last 40 years. And that sets up the rest of this opening section, which is Moses' challenge to this new generation to be different from their parents and to respond to God's grace with love and obedience. So he reminds them of the Ten Commandments, like the basics of the covenant, and then he gives them this very famous line. Listen, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Now, in Jewish tradition, this is called the Shema because the first Hebrew word in this line is Shema Yisrael. And this became a very important prayer in Judaism, said twice a day. And it emphasizes the Israelites' exclusive commitment to their God, the one true God who loved them and who rescued them from slavery. Right, because they're about to go into a land where people are worshiping many other gods. And Moses thinks that loyalty to the Lord, their God, is the only way to life. Now, notice these key words in the Shema, listen and love. You're going to find these words all over this opening section of the speech. The word listen in Hebrew means more than just let sound waves come into your ears. It includes the idea of responding to what you hear. So for Israel, this means responding to God's grace by obeying the laws of the covenant. And then listen is always followed by love. Yeah, so love is the true motivation for obeying the laws. Israel won't obey without love, and they don't truly love if they don't obey. So there's this tight connection between loving and listening that runs through the entire book. And so Moses tells them that if they do listen and love, they will fulfill their original calling as the family of Abraham to show all of the nations the wisdom and justice of God and so become a blessing to them. The second big section in Deuteronomy is a large block of laws and commands. And this is where the book gets its name. Deuteronomy means a second law. And it's because many of these laws we've heard before. In fact, in the first line of the book, we're told that Moses is here explaining or clarifying the laws. So he's repeating and expanding on the laws, making them relevant to this new generation. There's laws about how Israel's to worship God, laws about their leadership structure, laws about social justice, and then some more laws about their worship. Now, after all of the laws, Moses warns Israel of the consequences of their obedience or disobedience, or in his words, the blessing or the curse. If they listen and love, they will experience blessing and abundance in the land. And if they don't, there's going to be famine and plagues and they'll be forced off their land into exile. And that brings us to the final section of his speech. Yeah, here Moses says, I set before you today life or death, blessing or curse. So choose life. But then things get really interesting because after 40 years with these people, Moses knows they're not going to obey. And so he predicts their failure and even their future exile from the promised land. And he focuses on what he thinks is the true source of the problem, that they have hard and selfish hearts. It's as if Israel is incapable of truly loving God in a way that brings about obedience. But this problem isn't unique to Israel. Yeah, in fact, Moses, when he's using this language about blessing and curse, he's tying Israel's story all the way back to all humanity's story from Genesis 1 through 3. So Adam and Eve, they were blessed by God just like Israel, and 
given a choice to trust and obey God like Israel. And then they rebelled and brought a curse on the land like Moses knows Israel is going to do. And so these stories, they're about Israel's hard heart, but they're actually a window into the universal human condition. But Moses doesn't give up hope entirely. That's right. He says that somehow, on the other side of Israel's exile, God promises to transform their heart so that one day they truly can listen and love. In the final chapters, Joshua is appointed as the new leader of Israel. And then Moses takes the entire law code. The one he just predicted Israel would break. That's right. And he puts it into the Ark of the Covenant. And then Moses hikes up to the top of a mountain so we can see the promised land from afar. And then he dies. And that's how the Torah ends. Which is a strange place to end the story. I mean, it's right there at the climax. Will they obey the laws and live faithfully in the land or not? Well, the story does continue right into Joshua, the next book of the Bible. But this is the end of the Torah, and it's been ended here for a reason. The Torah is written for people who are either outside of the land or who are still waiting for the fulfillment of God's promise to bless the whole world. And so now as each generation reads the Torah, they find themselves called to hope in what Moses hoped for, a new transformed heart that one day can truly listen and love. Testing. There we are. All right. Let's open up to Deuteronomy 22. And as I said, we will cover 22 and 23, and we will move pretty quickly through these sections. We, as you saw in the video, there is the large section in the middle, chapters 12 to 26. So we're, you know, we're right, you know, kind of coming up on the tail end of that. But we're in the middle of this section that is all of these various laws. And it has proven to be a challenge for me in preparing only because those of you that have been here for a little while know that I like to have my studies all packaged nice and neat and alliterations in there. And uh, all of these sections have made that quite difficult. Uh, but God's word remains the same. It's true. It's faithful. And so we will look at it as it comes. And it won't be, my presentation won't be all nice and neat, but uh, the point will get across. So Deuteronomy 22 is broken up into four sections. Again, these are laws being given to the Israelites as they are about to head into the promised land. The first one is about caring for others. And I will give you the verses as we, as we go to each section, you'll see the verses on there for those of you that are taking notes. And then there is, he talks about the topic of, or the issue of mixing things. What's that all about? And then remembering, which is one verse, verse 12. It's going to, uh, we'll see that there. And then Everybody's favorite there, sexual purity, the most awkward one, right? And so let's go ahead and get into this first section, which is caring for, care for others, or caring for others, which is verses 1 to 8. And it starts out in verses 1 to 4, I'll put that right there, where he talks about caring for others' property. Now again, keep in mind, these are various laws. He's just dealing with all sorts of different topics. This is the equivalent of a dad or parent teaching his son or his daughter, his little kid, as he's raising this child, all about life. What do you do when you go to the DMV? What do you do when you have to make a call to the insurance company? You know, all the little ins and outs, those things that just scare you to death, some of you. This is a dad giving instructions for all these little things. And uh, so here's what he does. He tells them how to care for others' property. Verse 1, you shall not see your brother's ox or his sheep going astray. Now, we are going to come across some crazy subjects this morning. In fact, I can only wish that I was there for your lunch after church with your parents when they say, so what did Pastor Chris teach on today? Especially when we get to the next chapter, it's pretty wild. But here, we come across the very first one. You shall not see your brother's ox or his sheep going astray. Now, does anyone in here have a brother that owns an ox? No. Does anyone have a brother that owns an ox cord? Anybody? Anybody? Ox cord? Yes, thank you very much. Okay? Think of an ox as an ox cord. Let's read this again. You shall not see your brother's ox cord or his sheep going astray. 
Now, an ox score doesn't get up and walk away like an ox does, but roll with me. And hide yourself from them. You shall certainly bring them back to your brother. So he is talking about caring for others' property. Now, in order for us to understand these laws, these ancient laws that were given to the Israelites, and to have some practical or modern-day context and application, that's what we're doing here. That's my job. That's what you pay me the big bucks for. Let's talk about aux cords. Everybody knows what an aux cord is. We don't use them so much anymore because, man, we got blue tooth, right? Aux cord connects your phone to a stereo so that you can listen to music. And we don't need those really that much anymore, but every once in a while you get into the rental van or you, you know, maybe mom's van or dad's work truck still. It's like, oh man, we doesn't have Bluetooth. We still gotta use an aux cord. Aux cord connects your phone to the, uh, to the stereo so that you can listen to your music. Well, what he's saying here is, if you see your brother's aux cord just about to get lost, you know, you see it, it's about to go into the washer with someone's clothes. Or it's about to fall down the drain in the kitchen and go into the garbage disposal. Or it's about to fall out of the car, it just fell out of the car. What he's saying is, you need to care for your brother's stuff. And you need to get that ox cord and then return it to him. Easy money. See how that works? Now, some of us are guilty. Because we go, oh, his ox cord fell out. Oh, well, it's not mine. And we go on down the road. Many years ago, we were going to camp. Not this group, the previous church. And uh, we were on the five freeway, man. We we're just cooking along. We had everybody's gear in the back. Had a few cars going. Nice big group. Going camping up at Big Sur. And we're driving, and all of a sudden, there's somebody's pillow and sleeping bag. And there was a young man in my car. He doesn't watch these videos, so I can tell you. His name was Ryan. And Ryan looks, and he's like, oh, wait. And he looks, and then he's looking, and he goes, oh, it was my sister's stuff. <laughs> I was like, dude, dude, your sister ain't going to have a pillow and a sleeping bag. But he was like, oh, who cares? It's my sister's stuff. Some of you have brothers like that. They would be like, ah, it's just her bag. It's not a big deal. You know? No. What? God is, is, is saying through Moses, what he's telling him is you need to care for one another's property. And if there's something that you can do about it, you should save their property and return it to them. In my garage right now, if I go home, in my garage, now just a little weird little thing about me. You probably don't care about this, but I'm going to tell you anyways, because I'm teaching. I like bikes a lot. Like I like stuff, you know, soccer. I like yard work and I really like bikes, bicycles. Pedals, not electric, just pedal power. And in my garage, I've got a helmet, a bicycle helmet. Now, I don't even wear bicycle helmets, okay? Most of the time, my head is too fat. And uh, plus, you know, I'm like a rebel, man. I'm like, nah, I'm riding my bike, you know, without a helmet. You know, I'm, I'm living dangerously. But I've had this helmet for probably like 20 years, man, 20 years. And it just sits there. I rarely ever use it. It's kind of an old school helmet. Those of you that might know something about bicycle helmets, it's, it's more of an old school helmet. I got that helmet at, uh, I believe it was um, um, uh, Crystal Cove State Park at the beach. We had been out at the beach all day. We made our way back to the car. There was a vehicle there, a couple people. They were loading their bikes and they took off. They split and they left a bicycle helmet there on the table. And I thought, Thank you, Lord, for blessing me with this bicycle helmet. And I picked up that bicycle helmet, and I took it with me. According to this, that was wrong. That wasn't mine. I, I should have done one of two things. I either should have just left it there, because they may have gotten down the road, and the dude may have been like, oh, I left my helmet. we got to go back. And he could have come back looking for it. It's at my house in Highland. There's no way he's going to find it. Okay? Or I should have, you know, whistled at him. Like, hey, come back, get this helmet, or put it in my car and chased him down. Regardless of what I did, I should not have taken it. And to this day, every time I go out to the garage, I see that bike helmet hanging from my handlebars, and I just feel guilty. And I don't know what to do. There's nothing I can do about it now. 
What he goes on to say in this section on property is, is that if you know the individual, you take the animal, you know, you can take it back to him, care for them. But if you don't know who it is, he actually tells him you can take it to your house and just keep it there. That way, when they go around looking for it, they'll find it. But keep in mind that he's talking about animals and he's talking about people who live in close proximity to one another. Okay. I do not live anywhere near Crystal Cove. Okay. I live as far away from Crystal Cove as you can get. The gentleman that lost his bike helmet was never going to come to my door looking for his helmet. He had no idea who I was, where I was, where I was from, where my house was, nothing. And I knew that. And I stole that man's helmet. Guilty. Guilty. Okay? What he's telling them here is you need to take care of one another's property. Now, again, we go back before we leave this section. Maybe your brother doesn't have an ox, but maybe he's got an ox cord. Maybe he doesn't have an ox cord. Maybe he's got earbuds. Apple earbuds. Expensive. And you go, oh, look, there's his earbuds going into the washer. Oh, well, they're not mine. Nah. He says, if you, if it's in your power to do something about it, you need to step up and do something about it. Care for one another's property. All right. Let's move on to verses six and seven. Look at this. How to care for birds. What? Yeah. You got parakeets at home? He's not talking about parakeets. Verse six. Oh, by the way, did you notice I skipped verse five? Anybody notice that? No? Okay, I was going to give you a $20 Amazon gift card, but that's what, okay, so never mind. Verse 6, we, we're skipping verse 5. I'll come back to verse 5 later. I don't know if I'm supposed to do that, like just take it out and put it somewhere else, but I just did it. So verses 6 and 7, if a bird's nest happens to be before you along the way, in any tree or falls and it's on the ground, with young ones or eggs, with the mother sitting on the young or on the eggs, you shall not take the mother with the young. So you can take the young or you can take the eggs, but don't take the mother, don't take them all. Verse 7, it gets really serious. You shall surely let the mother go and take the young for yourself. That's okay. Look at this, verse 7. It turns, I mean, let's just go south real quick. That it may be well with you and that you may prolong your days. It sounds to me like God is saying, hey, if you come across a nest with birds and eggs or little chicks in there, don't take the mom. If you take the mom, I'll kill you. That's what it sounds like to me, okay? Now, I do not think that that's what he's saying. Here's what I think he's saying. Here's, here's what I believe is going on. He's telling them, if you come across a nest, let's just say let's just say chickens. Chickens are a common thing for us, right? You go, you find a chicken, and it's, it's on its eggs, you know, and you go, oh, man, this is really cool. And you take the eggs, and you go, you know what? Let's just take the chicken with us. We'll have fried chicken and eggs. You take both. Now what? Now you've got one less chicken, and you've got one less chicken producing eggs. Now you have just, maybe in a minute way, you have just cut your food supply a little bit short. Now, you go, oh, it was just me. Well, what if everybody does that? After a while, guess what? No more Chick-fil-A. No more canes on a Wednesday night after church, right? Then what? Then what? So he's saying, don't get greedy. Don't get greedy. Just, you can take the young ones or the eggs, but don't take the mom. Let the mom go. That way she produces more, more chicks, more eggs, more offspring. Okay? We're getting principles here. You understand? We're getting principles. Some of these things are applicable to us. You're going to come across some things. Wait till we get to verse 5. Verse 8, he talks about caring for others in your building projects. And he says in verse 8 that when you're building, and what they would do is they would build houses with flat roofs. Pretty cool. I don't know if you've ever been down to Mexico, but as you're driving on the one, high, the Highway 1, and you're, you're going into Mexico, go through TJ, and you're heading through, you know, Rosarito, man, you're on, you're on a cliff, basically, but it's just a beautiful drive, and then, and then you just see houses out there, and a lot of those houses have flat roofs, so that the people that are at the beach, because it's all ocean, and the people, you know, that live by the beach, man, they can be inside hanging out, doing whatever. Or they can take the stairs and go up to their roof. And they got patios. And so it's a great setup. He's saying if you're building a house and you've got a flat roof like that, you need to make a parapet. You need to build a parapet. Anybody know what a parapet is? Anybody know what a parapet is? Is Yes. Is it kind of like that canopy that we saw in Nicaragua? Hmm, I don't know. The, the canopy? We saw some can like the one inside the main uh, food place, or no? Yeah. Um, no, but that was really cool. Yeah, um, good guess. Thank you very much. 
A parrot pet is, uh, think it most commonly it's going to look like, or you would recognize it, on a castle. And at the top of the castle wall, you have that section at the top that's kind of up and down and up and down. Everybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah, up and down. That's a parapet. It keeps people from just walking off the edge of the, uh, of the building, of the roof. So he's saying you need to consider others when you're building your house. Don't just make a flat roof and you feel like, oh, that's cool, let's leave it flat. He says, no, you need to make some kind of guard so that people don't just walk off the edge. Now, he moves on to this section, and this is where we're going to find verse 5. That's where I stuck it. See that? Verses 9 through 11, and then verse 5. What's the deal there? Some of you may have gone ahead and read verse 5 already, but let's look at verse 9. You shall not sow your vineyard with different kinds of seed. I was talking about vineyards, grapes, wine. You shall not sow your vineyard, not to plant seeds, different kinds of seeds, when you're planting your vineyard. Lest the yield of the seed which you have sown and the fruit of your vineyard be defiled. So don't mix the seeds. If you're planting your vineyard, plant the same kind of seeds. Don't mix them up. Verse 10, you shall not plow with an ox and a donkey together. You're not to put two different kinds of animals together. Now, at this point, some of us go, man, see, God is a micromanager. And he, you think, why, why doesn't he just let us do whatever we want? That's a great question. Why doesn't he just let us do things however we want? Why do we have to, you know, we got, you know, God is looking for worshipers who worship in spirit and in truth. Why do I have to worship in spirit and truth? Why can't I just worship the way I want? I live in America. I should be able to just do whatever I want. Why is God this way? Why is he giving them all these little rules and all these, you know, you don't plow with an ox and a donkey. What if an ox and a donkey is all I got? God, what should I do? He says, don't mix them. Now, he starts with this, that he's talking about their farming. When they're farming, verses 9 and 10, don't mix the seeds. I can't even plant different kinds of grapes, really? You, 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 you got to just manage every point of my life? I'll explain. Verse 11, he goes on to say, I'll explain these. Verse 11 and 5 have to do with clothing. He says, you shall not wear a garment of different sorts, such as wool and linen mixed together. Oh, according to this. I'm in trouble, okay? I'm wearing viscose. You know what that is? Me either. <laughs> and uh, I think my pants are cotton, probably, or some kind of blend. According to this, I'm in trouble. But you ain't heard nothing yet. Look at verse five. A woman shall not wear anything that pertains to a man. Ooh. Oh. You ever heard of boyfriend jeans? Oh. He goes on to say in verse 5, nor shall a man put on a woman's garment. I'm okay with that. Okay? I'm okay with that. For all who do so, do so are an abomination to the Lord your God. What? This is, you know what an abomination is? An abomination, is, that indicates something that God hates. You go, man, this is pretty serious. The mixing of things. Now, he talked about the mixing of seeds the mixing of an ox and a donkey, different kinds of garment. You know, you can't wear, you know, so he gives an example such as wool and linen. Uh, you know, and listen, you, you need, there's a couple things here. We need, to, we need to stay here for just a moment, okay? So relax for just a moment before we move on. There are some Christians. I have spoken with them over the years. I don't run into them often, but I have run into them. Who hold steadfastly to these things. And they will judge you, man. They will judge you. And they will say, oh, you're a Christian. And you say, yeah. Oh. But you wear cotton and rayon, huh? Hmm. Okay. Hmm. Thought you were godly. Right? And you'll be like, what? And they'll go, no, it says that in Deuteronomy 22. And you'll go back in your Bible. Oh, my gosh. It does say that. So, let me, let me share something with you. Okay? couple things. Now that you and I have been through Deuteronomy, listen, you cannot, you cannot fool me. I know that Deuteronomy was written specifically for the Israelites leaving Egypt, going into the promised land. We'll talk about why that even, so, so what? What does that have to do with it? We'll talk about that. 
But secondly, here's a question that you always want to ask yourself. If somebody takes you to the Old Testament and they go, look what it says here, man. A big one right now, it's been a big one for a lot of years, Sabbath, the Sabbath, the Sabbath, the Sabbath. Oh, you don't go to church on Sunday? I mean, on, on Saturday, you go on Sunday? Mm, thought you were godly. And they'll put a trip on you. Here's what you always want to do with those things. You always want to say, okay, I see it there, Deuteronomy told you. Can you show me that in the New Testament? Where's that at? Where's, where's that at? Because there are things in here that are only for this group of people, only for the Israelites. Many of these things have a principle behind them, and we learn the mind of God as we, as we read through these. We go, oh, that's what God was thinking, and that's what we're doing today, much of this. But you and I always want to go, well, wait a minute, hold on. Show me, where's that at in the New Testament? Where did Paul talk about it? Where did Jesus talk about it? Where did, where did uh, Peter talk about it? Where did John talk about it? Where did James talk about it? Oh, they didn't? Ah. Oh. There are things that do not directly apply to you and I. So you can wear, you know, your rayon mixed with cotton, or you can wear your, uh, you know, your wool and, you know, polyester or whatever. It's not, that's not something that, that we have to be concerned about. That's not, that's not uh, uh, disappointing God or angering God or breaking his law. So the question is this, why does God tell them, don't mix the seeds, don't plow with different kinds of animals, don't wear different kinds of garments, you know, if you're going to wear wool, don't wear linen. If you're winning in linen, then don't wear wool. Verse 5, why can the girls, you see verse 5, a woman shall not wear anything that pertains to a man. See that? Imagine, right? Imagine. What he's talking about in verse 5 is about, we know it as cross-dressing. We know that. RuPaul's Drag Race. We know about that. It's on TV. It's normal. Not according to God. He didn't want that. And so he makes a, a, he says that those things are an abomination. He says that's an abomination. Now, is he talking about, a lot of times, you ladies, I'm not looking at anybody specific, Okay. A lot of times you ladies will roll in with jeans and a hoodie because, man, it's Sunday and it's cold and I was up late last night, jeans and a hoodie, right? And if it was a late night and you had a bad morning, the hoodie goes up over the hair <laughs> to cover that thing, right? And we're thankful for it. But if you are rolling in in a hoodie and some jeans, what does that mean? Does that mean that you are an abomination to the Lord? What does that mean? What if I, on a Sunday morning, I wake up, man, and I'm getting ready for church, and it's early in the morning, and it's dark in the room, and I'm going through the closet, and I was like, okay, yeah, 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 here's my shirt. Pull the shirt out, put my shirt on, and then I walk out of the house and go, oh, wait, I got my wife's T-shirt on. It was dark, plus I can't see that well. So and am I, have I now broken God's law? What are we talking about here? What he was talking about in verse 5 was individuals purposely attempting to blur the lines between genders. Now, that's something we know. Listen, verse 9, the seeds being planted. The uh, Verse 10, the animals being used. Verse 11, the different types of material. What is all of this about? I am so glad that you asked because we're talking about biblical principles here. What God is attempting to discourage and to stop is the blurring of the lines. Now, let me give you some application here for 2024. There is a push by a small segment of our society. The greater majority does not think this, but there is a small a section or a small uh, select few of people that do, and they are pushing really hard to do the same thing, to blur the lines. And what they want to do, the one that's most notable is, they want to blur the lines between genders. And they want to say, well, it doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman, you know, there's really no such thing. And what really matters is what my pronouns are. And this is what I call myself. I know what I look like on the outside, but this is what I am now. And they're blurring those lines. And they're saying things like, listen, we need to, we need to uh, uh, get rid of the nuclear family. Nuclear family is simply a term that is applied to a man and a woman who marry and have kids. Husband, wife, kids. We all go, well, I don't know, that's 
you know, some of you might be, you know, come from divorced families and steps and you know, all that kind of stuff. But the idea is just, just, a, just a family. Dad, mom, kids. There are people pushing to say, we need to just wipe that out and start all over. And God is saying, no, 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 no. We're not blurring the lines. What he's telling his people is there needs to be order. Let me ask you something. Is it a big deal that we blur the lines on gender? What's wrong with blurring? Let me ask you this. If you leave this parking lot after church and somebody in our state government decided that, uh, we don't need those lines out there telling us what to do. Let's just blur the lines. Oh, that means if somebody wants to drive on your side of the street going the opposite direction and they run into you and kill one of your family members, is blurring a big deal? It's a pretty big deal. Those lines ought never to have been blurred. All of a sudden we go, oh no, we, we don't want to blur the lines. What if we had electricians who said, code? I don't want to hear nothing about a code, man. We need to get rid of that old code. We need to just do our own thing. And they came into this building and they decided we're just going to put wires wherever we want. I like red ones. I really like red. I'm going to put red over here. And you, well, you know what? I really like blue. I'm, I'm going to throw some blue over here. Well, I don't feel like connecting it to that. I'm going to connect it to this over here. And then we're in here. We come in. We're ready to worship. We flick on the switch and the place burns down. Then was blurring the lines a big deal? It certainly was a big deal and ought not, never to have happened. What God is doing is he's establishing order, family. And he's saying that there are things, this, this is the way it needs to be. Now, what do you do if you're in Scotland or Ireland and some man comes out in a skirt, a kilt? I'm not saying anything to him. Have you seen those guys? I, I, immediately, I immediately think of Braveheart. And I'm like, you can wear anything you want. I'm not saying nothing. I'm not going to say anything. Right? What do you do? Nah. Look at, verse, look at verse 5. A woman shall not wear anything that pertains to a man, nor shall a man put on a woman's garment, for all who do so, do so are an abomination to the Lord your God. Well, how do we know what pertains to a man, and how do we know what pertains to a woman? Like, so this had to do with culture there at the time. It, 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 it was, it was going to be determined different ways, different times. Everybody for the most part, wore long garments, long robe, long dress looking thing. You know, whenever you see like, you know, some play or some movie about biblical times, one of the things that I always think is, oh, this is really cool. Why are the guys in dresses? That's why I always think that. But that's generally how they, how they dress. What God is doing is he's establishing order, family. And so what does that tell us? It tells us that God desires order. He doesn't desire to micromanage you and tell you, no, don't put that kind of seed in that kind of seed. What he's saying is there needs to be order. We need to establish some order, law and order. We like law and order. We like law and order. I mean, what's the difference between loving and killing somebody? I mean, come on. You're just, you know, just talking about semantics. You know, I love the person, but I'm going to kill him. You know, what's the deal? No, blurring the lines. There's a big deal. We're not doing that. We're just, that we, we need some law and order. So God is saying, don't mix, don't, don't blur the lines, he's telling his people. Now, are any of you ladies in trouble for having on guys' clothes? No. Because we know that God looks at the heart, right? He looks at the heart. Let's move on. Hopefully that's all just as clear as mud to you. Remembering here in Deuteronomy uh, chapter, uh, I'm sorry, verse 12, what he tells them is to put, it's one verse, but he tells them to put um, um, uh, cords uh, uh, or tassels on the four corners of your clothing. You go, what for? Well, back in, for those of you that are taking notes, Numbers 15, verses 37 to 41. Numbers 15, verses 37 to 41. He had already give them, given them instructions about this. And they were to add some blue into the, into the tassels when they sewed those things. But what were the tassels for? It was so that when you're at the store and your kids really want some Twinkies, they can grab the tassel and go, Mom, Dad, please, can I have some Twinkies? That's not really what it was for, okay? It's not really what it was for. It was a reminder. They would look at the tassel and go, oh, that's right. I belong to the Lord. It's the same thing. You know, I see some, some people with cross necklaces on. 
or you might have a Christian t-shirt on, it's a reminder. You're like, you know what? Oh, that's right. Got my cross, right? I belong to Jesus. Lord, help me not to kill this fool right now because I'm representing you. Okay. It's a reminder. It's a reminder that I need to, oh, that's right. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I belong to God. All right, let me just, I'm going to let it go. Let's move on. Okay, so it was a way of remembering. Now, at verse 13, <laughs> verses 13 down to verse 30, talking about sexual purity. And the first section from verses 13 down to verse 21. Let me put that up there. Verses 13 to 21 is a doozy. He's talking about virginity. Now, I do not assume that you all are dumb, okay? So please, I want to make sure we're clear so that after church, when you're eating sushi, and mom says, what did Pastor Chris talk about today? And you go, virginity. <laughs> what? <laughs> right? Listen, you think this is awkward? Oh, we got stuff coming up. Okay, let's move. He's talking about virginity. Now, Virginity is a term that we use for someone that has not had sex yet, okay? Um, he explains here in these verses, it is a trip. I'm going to sum it up for you so that we can move on. What he says here, he gives instructions. He says, if a man, young man and young woman get married, okay, and they consummate their marriage with sex, and then the man at some point after that decides, I hate this woman. Sounds sad, right? And then what he does is he goes, I'm going to claim that she was not a virgin. And then I'll divorce her. What happens at that point is the dad, if in fact she was a virgin when they got married, the mom and dad can show up to court with a call it a wedding sheet and it would have evidence of their daughter's virginity at the time of marriage um i'm, I'm treading lightly because i'm not trying to get emails from your mom okay when the two people consummate their marriage there was there are some membranes that break and there would be some blood left on on the sheet and then, believe it or not, this was a normal part. It, it, it was a trip. If you go back, if you ever go back and you you study ancient weddings, even there's still some places around the world, some wedding practices, you would just be like, they do what? This is one of those times. They would purposely put that sheet over the bed on the wedding night so that the parents could come and collect it and keep it for this kind of a topic, for this kind of a situation. What would happen is this, this man goes, I, I hate this woman. She was not a virgin, and I'm divorcing her. What can happen is the dad shows up, and he goes, oh, no, 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 no. No, she was a virgin. And the, the judges go, you got proof? As a matter of fact, I do. I've got the wedding night sheet. And they pull out the wedding sheet and show all your business. Here, Mom, you go on that side. Hold it. Look at this. I have heard one Bible teacher was saying that they, that they actually used to take this sheet with a little bit of blood on it and hang that display it outside of their house for everybody in the community to go, mm, see, told you her daughter was righteous. And they would see that and go, oh no, yeah, she, she, was, she was a virgin when she got married. Wow, imagine that, all your businesses out there displayed, like hanging out there like a flag, you know? And so then at that point, if it was proven, if they said, well, she was a virgin, the dude is lying, then the guy, the husband, would be responsible to pay the dad a certain amount of money. He'd have to pay a fine. And then he would never be allowed to divorce his wife. What does that do? Now, in turn, if in fact she was not a virgin, and that's found out, then she is going to lose her life for not being a virgin and for lying and for dishonoring her husband and her parents. So it's pretty serious, okay? Pretty serious. What is all, what if you go like, wait, wait, man, that just sounds so barbaric, man. What, what is God doing? Listen, what he's doing is he is 
promoting sexual purity, by promoting virginity, and he is also protecting people in the process. He's protecting the young lady, if in fact she was a virgin and she's falsely accused. He's protecting the husband, if in fact she was not what she said she was. But it's also preventative maintenance. See, if I'm a young man and I just think, oh my gosh, this girl is so cute and I just want to marry her up and just make her mine. And then afterwards, I just go, mm, nah. And I go, mm, I'm just going to tell everybody that she was not really a virgin. Well, if she was a virgin, then I got to pay. And then, you know, so I'm fine and then I can, I can never divorce her. So it, it prevents me from just jumping into relationships and just like, oh, you know, let's, let's, let's just do this, man. Let's just go, let's come on. I got I to gotta really think like, so like, is this, is this really, really worth it? Okay. For the girl, it promotes virginity because if she's not, if she decides that she's going to get the hookups with somebody, you know, at school, at wherever they're at, you know, and then she's got to think one of these days I'm going to get married. And if they find out I wasn't a virgin, they are going to kill me at my father's doorstep. Oh, I got to think about this. You see what I'm saying? It prevents. It's not God just looking for ways like, oh, okay, let me just come up with some ways to kill people. He's not doing that. That's not what he's doing. He's applying law and order to all these situations. You want to move on? Move on to adultery. Verse 22, let me put it up here for you. Adultery, verses 22 to 24. If a man is found lying with a woman, in other words, having sex with a woman, now listen very carefully. If he's found lying with a woman married to a husband, then both of them shall die. The man that lay with the woman and the woman, so you shall put away the evil from Israel. If a young woman is a vir who is a virgin is betrothed to a husband. We know what betrothed means. It means they're engaged. And a man finds her in the city and lies with her. Then you shall bring them both out to the gate of that city, and you shall stone them to death with stones. The young woman, because she did not cry out in the city, and the man, because he humbled his neighbor's wife, so you shall put away the evil from among you. So adultery is forbidden. And it's not just like, um, uh, you know what, just, uh, just talk to them, make sure they never do it. He's like, no, we'll kill him. Now, I read through that. Here's why. Do you remember when the woman caught in adultery was brought to Jesus? Remember that story? One of my favorites. And Jesus, they bring this woman. They say, Rabbi, we caught this woman in the act of adultery. The law says that she should be stoned. And he goes, hmm, yeah. He agrees and says, okay. Whichever one of these guys here, your accusers, whichever one of you does not have uh, sin, go ahead, you throw the first stone. And then he kneels down and begins to, with his finger, write in the dirt. And, and the term that's being used for him writing in the dirt means that he was writing accusations in the dirt. And so it is believed, we do not know this for sure because nobody knows what he wrote exactly. But it is believed that he said, okay, you know, you accusers, whoever brought her, Go ahead. Whoever does not have sin in their life, if you're not guilty, go ahead and stone her. And then it is believed that he knelt down in the dirt and started writing with his finger. You know, he's like, oh, uh, let's see. Uh, John is here. Um, John, last week, you were hooking up with your neighbor's wife. Mm, okay. And then he looked like, oh, uh, Steve. Oh, mm, Steve. Oh, Steve. Steve. <laughs> Steve, you hooked up with, you know, you know X, Y, Z. And oh, oh, you, oh, you, you. And it is believed that as he went through each name, that, you know, John standing there was like, ooh, I got to go. And then Steve is like, ooh. You know, and the next person is like, ooh, Steve, you did that. Oh, there's my name. <laughs> it is believed that Jesus, he, he was writing down all the things that they had done. <laughs> Somebody asked, why didn't Jesus? Jesus was the only one there without sin. Why didn't he stone her? Because they were breaking the law already. Right here, it says that they needed to bring the man and the woman. They just brought the woman. So, foul play already. If you're going to follow the law, follow the law. So, how interesting. 
they were breaking the law, trying to get Jesus to break the law. Foolishness. What about rape? Obviously, rape is forbidden by God. And as we find here, um, but if a man finds a betrothed young woman in the countryside and the man forces her and lies with her, then only the man who lay with her shall die. So the punishment for rape was death. Okay. Um, we move on to verses, I'm sorry, I keep, rape is covered in verses 25 through 27. Okay. The next one is what we call fornication. Okay. What's the difference between fornication and adultery? Both are dealing with sex. Both are dealing with sex outside of marriage. Adultery is the term that we use for people who are married and they have sex outside of marriage. Fornication is the word that we use for those that have not been married yet, and so they're having sex before marriage. Okay, hopefully that's, that's clear. But fornication in verses 28 and 29, if a man finds a young woman who is a virgin, who is not betrothed, and he seizes her and lies with her, and they are found out, then the man who lay with her shall give to the young woman's father 50 shekels of silver, and she shall be his wife because he has humbled her. He shall not be permitted to divorce her all his days. So you can't just, you know, according to God, he doesn't want you just going out and just hooking up with everybody. Okay, there was a penalty for that. It wasn't death, but um, it was a serious penalty. And then finally in verse 30, he deals with incest. Very briefly, a man shall not take his father's wife. So a man can't hook up with his mom or even his stepmom. And uh, this is applicable, you know, we know that he's, he's not to be hooking up with, you know, any of his family members, okay? So God establishing law and order. Let's rip through chapter 30 real quick. We've got a few minutes. Let's get right there. I'm sorry, chapter 30. Deuteronomy 23, the next chapter. And you'll see all of the different headings there, protecting the assembly, cleanliness in the camp, providing for escaped slaves, prostitution forbidden, charging interest making vows, eating your neighbor's produce. Did you know that God allowed all you can eat? Woo, I think about shakies. Let's just talk about, let's get there, okay? Verse one, okay? I told you we are going to go some places today, okay? Let's talk about protecting the assembly. And please forgive me. Let me show you something real quickly, okay? I... I re realize this in the first service. Please forgive me. Those of you that take notes. Accepted and rejected. Those words should be flip-flopped. Verses 1 to 6, he deals with those that have been rejected from the assembly. We'll talk about what that means. And then verses 7 8, he talks about those that are accepted into the assembly. Again, I'll explain those. But we begin with verse 1. Now, I am so thankful. I like the English Standard Version. I use the New King James Version to teach. I've been doing it for years. I like the English Standard Version. However, I am so glad that I'm not using the ESV today to teach. Okay? Those of you that have a different translation, don't be showing your neighbors. Okay? Just let me deal with this. Verse 1. He who is emasculated by crushing or mutilation shall not enter the assembly of the Lord. Okay? What are, we, what are we talking about here? Well, to be emasculated is a term that is used for a man that has lost his manhood. You say, he's been emasculated. Sometimes you'll hear it tossed around today when, when uh, some man, when his wife is she's bossing him around. And it's like, ah, he's been emasculated by his wife. It means his, his manhood is gone. His bravado, his machismo, man, like, mm, right? It's gone. So what is he talking about here? He who is emasculated, he's lost it. Okay, he's lost his manhood by crushing or mutilation? What? Okay, follow with me. He is talking about a man who has been, has lost his manhood by crushing or mutilating his external sexual organs, okay? We might say his private parts. And you go, wait, what are we talking about? <laughs> Can you imagine Red Robin 
Can we please have some more fries? No bottomless fries. So what did Pastor Chris talk about today? Oh, let's talk about it later. Let's talk about it later. Let me explain to you what in the world is happening here. What is he talking about? What is he talking about? There are individuals most commonly referred to as eunuchs. E-U-N-I-C-H-S. I don't remember. Uh, E-U-N-I-C-H-S. Eunuchs. You've heard about them before. Okay. Muchas mahalo. Okay. Eunuchs. These are individuals that have had their... Uh, their, 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 their external sexual organs removed. And you go, wait, what? It was very common, actually, among royal families, not for themselves, but for their servants to have them either what we call castrated or everything cut off. You go, why would they do that? Because they were a royal, and they did not want this servant this slave hooking up with somebody in the royal family, having kids, that, you know, it, 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 uh, it dirties the royal line. So they would oftentimes have their servants, what we call castrated, emasculated. However, uh, so, so there were some that had no choice in the matter. They just, they were slaves, they were born into that position, and that's what happened. However, there were some others that did it by choice. You go, why in the world would anybody do that by choice? People have actually done it in more recent modern times. Uh, I'm not telling you to go Google it or look it up or investigate it, but it has been done. Sometimes there have been uh, uh, sexual offenders who had themselves, had, had their body parts removed because in their mind, they thought, hey, I, I'm, I'm a, I'm a, they knew that they were a danger to society. And they figured, let's get rid of what's, you know, what, what the problem is, is. And let's get rid of it. And so they did that to themselves. However, here's what I want you to remember. That these laws were given to a people, the Israelites, who were, is it getting hot in here or is it just me? These laws were given to people that were, had been, they had been camping with God, okay? And they were now moving into a society that was idolatrous. And I've told you some crazy things about idolatry and what the Canaanites were involved. That's where they're going. They're going into, the, into Canaan. I've told you some crazy things already. Well, maybe here's one of the craziest, maybe the craziest. Self-mutilation, self-harm, was part, an integral part of idolatry. There is a well-known story about Elijah and the prophets of Baal. Salud. And they are up on this mountain and they're having a contest. And Elijah goes, hey, all the prophets of Baal, he goes, we're going to have a contest. We've got an altar. We've got an offering. He said, let's, let's just see whose God will send fire down first. And then he goes, he, he tells the prophets of Baal, just one guy, he tells the prophets of Baal, go ahead, you guys go first. And the prophets of Baal, they go, fine. Baal, he's going to hear us, he's going to send down fire. And they just start going at it, man. They're chanting, they're dancing, they're jumping around, they're yelling, they're screaming. At one point, Elijah, Elijah, he's just like watching them, and he's like, hey, yell a little bit louder, he might be on the toilet. He to actually told them that. And so they're screaming and yelling. And at one point, they get so caught up, they actually begin to mutilate themselves. They, they actually begin to cut themselves, attempting to get the attention of their God. It was part of idolatry. It's one of the things that they did. And in Canaan, anything goes, baby. Anything goes. It's just like California. Anything goes. You do whatever you want. Call yourself whatever you want. Dress however you want. We have parades celebrating this stuff in our major cities. And so mutilation, self-harm was, was, was an intimate part of their idolatry. So God is saying, when you go into the promised land, we don't conduct ourselves like that. That's the, we're not living like that, is what God is telling them. Now, he goes on to say, he who is emasculated cannot enter the assembly. 
He says in verse 2, one of illegitimate birth, so born out of marriage, outside of marriage, cannot enter the assembly. Verse 3, an Ammonite or a Moabite cannot enter the city. Or the, the assembly, not the city, the assembly. Now, we hear that and we go, wait a minute. So there were people that God would just automatically reject? Like, what, what are we talking about here? Well, there's some question here as to what we mean by, or what the writer, what the scripture means by assembly. And, and what are we talking about assembly? Oftentimes when the people gathered for worship, it was called a congregation. They congregated and worshiped. I believe that when it's talking about the assembly here, it's talking about leadership. And I think what God is saying is that these individuals, they can be part of the worship of God, but they cannot be part of the, the, uh, the, 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 the leadership. In Isaiah 56, verse 3 through 5, the Lord has utterly separated me from his people. I'm sorry, nor let the eunuchs say, here I am, a dry tree. For thus says the Lord, to the eunuchs, who keep my Sabbaths and choose what pleases me and hold fast my covenant. Even to them I will give in my house and within my walls a place and a name better than that of sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. So God even loved eunuchs. So I think that what is being said in our passage here is we're talking about leadership, I think. I do not think that this means that if you're a eunuch or you are an Ammonite or a Moabite that you can't turn your life around and turn it over to God. Because we know that, that's, you can absolutely do that, regardless of who you are, okay? We move on to those who are accepted, and he tells us there in verses 7 and 8 that it is the uh, Edomites and the Egyptians are accepted. Let's move on. We'll move fast through here. We've got to finish this up because we've got a meeting to get to. Cleanliness in the camp. In verses 9 through 11, he talks about a purification process when the men go out to war and they're camping. If they somehow soil themselves in the middle of the night. I know. There is a purification process. They have to leave the camp, go outside the camp, and they go through this process, but they can come back in later on. And then look, when was the last time you saw this in a Bible study? Okay, Verses 12 through 14, he has rules on going potty. If you are out at camp and you got to go to the bathroom, he says, don't just do it in the camp. He says, go outside the camp. And in fact, Take something with you, a tool. You go out there, you do your business, and then cover it up with dirt. Okay? Even dogs and cats do that. And then he gives the reason why in verse 14, for the Lord your God walks in the midst of your camp. So don't just be leaving your stuff laying around because God's coming. You don't want him stepping in your mess so clear it keep it clean keep it clean now verses 15 and 16 i don't have any sub points there escaped slaves god says if a slave escapes and comes to you let him remain free don't turn him in let him live wherever he wants in verse 16 in verses 17 and 18 the, the land that they were going into had male and female prostitutes he says prostitution is forbidden and he goes on to say that uh, if, the, if a prostitute earns money and tries to bring it to God as a sacrifice, not accepted. You cannot be uh, using money from you know, sinful, uh, a sinful lifestyle like that to give to God. He goes on in verses 19 and 20 to talk about charging interest. And he talks about two different groups. Fellow Israelites, do not charge them interest in verse 19. Foreigners, you can charge them interest. But he still doesn't want them to be greedy charging interest vows in verses 21 through 23 sorry that i'm moving fast verses 21 to 23 has to do with vows no sub points there i'll just sum it up for you if you say it pay it in other words if you made a promise you made a vow you gave your word and said no i'm going to do this you better do it now you better do it even even if it applies to just you and your friends or a family member but especially when it applies to god he actually says in verse 22, but if you abstain from vowing, it shall not be a sin to you. In other words, it's better if you don't vow at all, but if you do, you better make sure you follow through, okay? And then finally, we'll finish here, right in time for lunch, eating your neighbor's crops. 
he says this in verses 24 and 25. He says, you are allowed to go to your, your neighbor's vineyard or to their crops, and you can eat as much as you want, but, but only what you pick in the moment. He says, don't go over there with your bag, throwing, you're like, oh, let's go grocery shopping in our neighbor's yard and just go strip all of their crops. Like, oh, okay, all right, let's get out of here. He says, no, you can go over, you can eat grapes, you can eat, you know, stuff, and, you know, eat as much as you want, but then just split. Don't be trying to take, don't get greedy is what he's saying. All of these rules and all of these laws, law and order, why? Because law and order helps a society to function properly, and God was concerned with that. 